in today's show. Talk about the Blazers' loss to the Jazz, Anthony Simon's last eight games without CJ McCollum in the lineup, and how the Blazers have pulled out of early season tailspins in the past. Welcome to Lockdown Blazers. Let's get into it. You are Locked On Trailblazers, your daily Portland Trailblazers podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What up, world? It's your past first point guard and Trailblazer reporter, Mike Richmond. You are listening to another episode of Locked On Blazers, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, available wherever you get podcasts and now also on YouTube. We're probably not going to get our 2,000 subscribers by 2022. But that doesn't mean you shouldn't subscribe. We're still trying to get up to 2,000 on YouTube. We're getting close. We're pushing towards 1,800. And I would still appreciate the support, even if we're not going to hit our, our arbitrary goals. Uh, still go to YouTube and subscribe to the show if you haven't already. If you're watching on YouTube, go ahead and subscribe. In today's show, we're talking about the Blazers' loss to the Utah Jazz. Shorthanded again against one of the best teams in the league. Not a lot to take away from this game, but we'll still break down what happened in that home loss to Utah. I want to talk a little bit about Anthony Simons. There's a listener question about what uh, Simons has been like since CJ McCollum has been out of the lineup. We'll address Simons' recent play and sort of his uh, long-term outlook with the with the franchise, uh, whether that's been impacted. And then finally, to close the show, we'll talk about the Blazers' tailspins in the past and how they've sort of dug out of early season holes. It's They're not... It, Early season struggles, not new to this team, but how they have approached those early, those, um, and kind of turned those seasons around or, or made the, you know, scrambled to make the playoffs in those seasons, I think gives us um, an insight into what it's going to take for them to fix this particular season. But let's, let's just go ahead and get into it. We're talking fastest recap in the West. The Blazers lose 120-105 to the Utah Jazz yesterday evening. Um, this was at the Motor Center on Wednesday night. I'm recording this on a Thursday morning, so uh, we're a little bit late. But that's what happens when the games – I'm on the East Coast. And the games go till 1 a.m. Had to wake up in the morning and do this one. Um, Blazers lose 120-105. They were down 14-2 early. Looks like it was going to be an absolute rout. But they kind of rallied a little bit and only down 36-27 after one. Missed a couple open looks that would have even cut deeper into that lead. Didn't close the quarter super well, but we're right in it. Only down nine against a very good Jazz team. Found themselves down 12 at halftime. Uh, 60 or excuse me, 10 at halftime, 69, 59. Again, still in punching distance. They didn't, or striking distance. They didn't go away in this game. And then after three heading into the fourth quarter, they're down 96, 82. They never got, they were down 14 at the end of three, never got closer than 12 down the stretch. Just, this was a talent game. They did not have the talent to stay in it. The Jazz finished with 74 points in the paint, outscored the Blazers 74-30 in the paint on route to a 120-105 win. That's your fastest recap in the West. The Blazers again without CJ McCollum and then seven players in the uh, league's health and safety protocols, including uh, Robert Covington and Yusuf Nurkic, Dennis Smith Jr., um, Ben McLemore, all guys who are playing on a regular basis prior to this uh, part of part of the rotation. I guess Dennis Smith Jr. wasn't, but he still um, he would have played if he was uh, if he was available. And this one, Blazers, you know, without um, without all their parts, the Jazz, of course, without maybe not of course, but the Jazz without uh, Donovan Mitchell, who's dealing with a back strain, so they weren't whole. But the Jazz are still one of the best teams in the league. Like they're just they're straight up fantastic, and they looked like it early in this game. The Jazz got whatever they wanted going against the Blazers pick and roll defense with uh, Rudy Gobert. They just stopped looking at Gobert. That was. Basically, the only reason Go- Gobert finished with 22 and 14 is the only reason that he didn't um, have a bigger night is they just stopped looking at him. Uh, Hassan Whiteside, when he played, had a similar success. Um, a very Whiteside night, 15 and 11, dude, is a production monster in 19 minutes. Jazz has got 19 from Jordan Clarkson off the bench and a really good game from Rudy Gay, who hit three threes and finished with 21 points and six boards. Uh, on the Blazers' side, 32 for Norman Powell. 32 for Damian Lord, and then no one else had more than 14. Larry Ness Jr. finished with 14, 9, and 9. Assist and a uh, assist and a rebound short of a triple-double to go with three steals. Uh, one of Nance's better games for sure. It just, on the other end, they didn't have the size to match up. Uh, Blazers didn't get a ton of production off the bench. Anthony Simons, 7 points on 3 of 13. We'll talk a little about him in the second segment. Uh, 6 points from C.J. Elby, um, who also played real minutes. Uh, 
the big story for me in this game was not that Nazir Little and Tony Snell struggled, like whatever. It's it, the Blazers just undermanned and it's hard for them to the guys just to scale up and be uh, sort of a bigger part of the offense. Uh, to me, the like the notable part of this game was Reggie Perry. Uh, the Blazers, a former second round pick of the Nets who played about 25 games for the Nets in the uh, uh, 1920 season, uh, excuse me, 2021 season. Um, and he made his, his Blazers debut, played 14 minutes, finished with four points, three boards and four fouls. Um, straight up, <laughs> I think Reggie Perry's 14 minute shift uh, against the Jazz on Wednesday night was one of the feel good stories of the year. He played hard. They needed size. He came in and brought them size, uh, you know, had, had a little floater, was, uh, you know, contesting Hassan Whiteside in the paint, uh, got away with a couple just like straight up fouls, blocking Jordan Clarkson in the rim, like played hard, played aggressive, played physical. Um, his other bucket was uh caught it on the roll and kind of sidestepped. You might call it a Euro steps more of a sidestep looping uh, to finish with his right and the left-hand side uh, layup. Like um, I-, I said in the previous podcast that I kind of thought Reggie Perry was good. And then he wasn't in the NBA for basically a full year. So shows what I know, but Reggie Perry, 14 minutes, um, truly a feel good moment. I-, I like, what is he like a six foot eight, 250 pound, like backup center, like kind of an undersized backup center, but physicality to play in the NBA for sure showed a little bit of his touch was really physical and played really hard um in a loss to a really good team Reggie Perry stood out to me even on a night where Norm Powell and Damian Lord uh each had 32 and were really good um you know Norm played too many minutes 43 but what are you gonna do he was um he had it going and the Blazers were kind of within within the range to um to make this a game Unlike the game, the previous game against Dallas Mavericks, where I was really hard on the Blazers and did not think they played hard enough and thought they just kind of um, kind of quit after things went, went their way, I did not come away from the Jazz game feeling that way. I felt like the Jazz, you know, the Blazers are super, super duper shorthanded and the Jazz are really, really good. And the Blazers were kind of vaguely didn't they didn't get punked like they didn't get punked it was a talent game the 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 jazz are just just had more talent than them and they didn't have um the right parts this wasn't like just not rotating over and letting Dwight Powell and Chris Apps Porzingis get dunks this was just like not not quite good enough I thought early on the defense was really spotty um they changed things up and started being a little more uh, handsy with Gobert on his roles and then the jazz just straight up stopped looking at Gobert and his roles that really helped the Blazers scheme um and the Blazers you know they lose they're, you know, they're still, they're struggling. They, they're, they were 10 and one at home. They're now one and eight in their last nine home games. They're 13 and 21 overall. Um, they're not like, this isn't good, but not a lot to take away from this game, particularly like I didn't think they played poorly. I thought they played about up to their potential with the roster that they had available and they lost to a really good team. Like that's, um, that's your slowest recap in the West is that I'm not, I, I refuse to freak out about this game. Like it was fine. It was fine. Um, not what, um, you know, not the result you wanted, but I don't think this was like a demoralizing loss. This was just like the reality of the league is they didn't, the Blazers didn't have enough guns to hang with one of the good teams and they lost. That's, that is, uh, I, that's my real takeaway and Reggie Perry fun, Reggie Perry, fun, fun. It's a big takeaway. Uh, capital, capital F on that one. Reggie, like this is where we're at in the season is that four and three from a backup center in 14 minutes. I was like, hell yeah. I'm sitting on my couch at after midnight, like way to go Reggie. Um, but other than that, I don't think there was a, a lot of major takeaways from this game. If there is a major takeaway is that Ambry Simons hasn't stepped into the void left by CJ McCollum's absence. Um, a listener asked a question about uh, Simon's recent play. And I want to spend the second segment kind of discussing where I'm at with Ant and his development and, and et cetera, et cetera. So that's what we'll do in the second segment. Before we get there though, I want to tell y'all about Truebill. Do you know why tri- free trials renew without your consent? It's a business scam that's out to get you. So don't let greedy corporations pocket your money. You can download Truebill and take control of your subscriptions. It's a new app that helps you identify and stop paying for subscriptions that you don't need, you don't want, or simply forgot about. And on average, people save up to $720 a year with Truebill. Because companies are making subscriptions harder and harder to cancel, Truebill is here to make it incredibly simple. You link your accounts, and with one tap, Truebill will let you cancel your unwanted subscriptions. And if it's more than one tap, a Truebill concierge is there when you need them to cancel the subscription so you don't have to. Uh, I went to 
uh, truebill.com slash locked on NBA. I downloaded the app on my phone and less than 15 minutes, about 10 total minutes, maybe 12, if I'm being honest, I had downloaded the app and had all my subscriptions right in front of me on my phone. Super easy to use, super useful. Um, you know, get, get your eyeballs and what you're paying for, decide what you want to keep and decide what you don't go to truebill.com slash locked on MBA right now. Start canceling today and don't fall for any more subscription scams. Go right now. Truebill.com slash locked on MBA could save you thousands a year. That's truebill.com slash locked on NBA. All right. So we talked about Blazers loss to the Jazz and your fastest and slowest recap in the West, your normalist speed recap in the West. I'm actually doing that recap in the West from the East. Probably should have changed the branding, but that's what you get. Um, in this segment, though, and this is a spill over from the mailbag and one that I thought deserved some, some more attention. And I thought it would be relevant after this game. And quite frankly, it was. Anthony Simons goes, you know, uh, struggles in this game. He wasn't bad necessarily. He just wasn't good. You know, he just, he just, he didn't shoot it particularly well. And it continued to trend for Simons. And, and so it, it follows a question from Family Twine on Twitter, at Family Twine. Uh, family Twine is a family podcast. Um, uh, it's, parent and child teenage child podcast um they, they do it weekly it's um it's you know heartwarming quite frankly um if that doesn't embarrass one of the co-hosts uh and that question from a, a question from family twine was Anthony simons is struggling the last eight games without cj and has really hurt the team in the short term do you think his role with the team has changed long term i think the simplest answer to this question is no but let's unpack Amphrey Simon's struggles a little bit. Um, let me say up front that I think um, I, th- I think the thing Ant does score with the ball in his hands is the most valuable thing in the league. So some of Ant's deficiencies don't matter as much because he's really good at the most important thing in the league, which is go get buckets. Um, you know, there's other stuff that matters, and I think Ant's fit on the roster um, kind of exasperates some of his struggles, but go, go get a bucket and is capable of, and it's one of the most valuable skills in the league, but Simons is no doubt struggling at, over his last eight games. It doesn't really play out in the averages. He's averaging 11.6 points and 2.1 assists, but he's shooting 34% from the floor, 34.9% from three and 93% from the stripe prior to this eight game stretch without CJ McCollum in the lineup, when there's just been a void and the Blazers need him to step up, you know, 11 and two on 34% shooting is like, it's, that's not good. We can all agree. We can just look at the numbers and know it's not good. And I think you've seen Ant with the consistency problems. You know, there's a night where he goes for 26 against the T-Wolves and then a night where he goes um, for two, or or excuse me, scoreless against the San Antonio Spurs. But prior to this eight-game stretch, the first 22 games of the year, Ant was just like, for for instance, Ant was averaging 12 and 2.2. So barely, barely much, barely any difference. He's playing about four less minutes a night. He's been, up, he's up to playing four more minutes a night with CJ out of the lineup. Not a huge uptick in minutes, but a, more, more for sure. Um, and his averages are, you know, roughly the same, but he was just shooting way better. From the first 22 games, 46% from the floor, basically 45.9% from the floor, 38% from three and averaging 12 and 2.2. So he's averaging a little bit, fewer points, like slightly fewer points, slightly fewer assists, but it's just, it's a shooting averages thing. According to cleaning the glass.com, the uh, subscription stats service that provided by Ben Falk, former NBA uh, stats guru with the Blazers and then front office executive with the Philadelphia 76ers. Uh, they do like a rolling 10 game average. So like, just, it's like, just basically like how guys have compared to the league average and also their season average over 10 game intervals. And over the last 10 games, Anthony Simons is effective field goal percentage is below league average and below his season average, his assist percentage, which is like the percentage of assists when you're on the court, the percentage of assists you account for um, that's down his assist to usage percentage higher, you know, based on how many times you have the ball and how many, uh, uh, possessions you finish versus how many assists you make. That's also down. Like he's just, he's just, it's not, it hasn't been there for him. It's below his season average and below the league average the last 10 games. He's been worse. He's been worse. And there's been this void for him to step into without, without um, CJ's, without CJ's minutes, right? Like there's been space for Ant to step in and he hasn't done it. He hasn't been wholly worse. And he's had moments in games where you're like, Oh, still a bucket. Um, in fact, I'm, I am a long-term believer in Amphrey Simons as a starter in the NBA. Like I, I don't look at Ant's game and think that he's an all-star. I don't look at Ant's game and think like this dude is, um, you know, a multi-time all-star or anything like that. I, I think the, 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 
my ceiling for him is long-term NBA starter, but long-term NBA starter is one hell of a career, right? Like <laughs> that's very good. Um, it's hard to be good in the league. It's hard to be bad in the NBA. If you play a long time, it means you're good. If you play a long time as a starter, it means you were really good. And I still think Amphrey Simons could be that. But the question from Family Time, from Family Twine, uh, at Family Twine on Twitter, podcast available wherever you get podcasts, go ahead and check it out. Um, that's right. If you ask a smart question, I'll, I'll give you a free promo on the show. Shout out to Family Twine. Um, the question is that, um, like, does his long-term role change? And I think this is worth unpacking a little bit because Amphrey Simons is heading into free agency. This is his fourth year in the league. Um, he didn't sign a uh, an extension when he was rookie eligible prior to the start of the season. Uh, very, very t- not typical of the Blazers under Neil Olshay. They've signed two players to rookie extensions, Damon CJ. Amphrey Simons is not that level of player. Um, he could potentially become something akin to what CJ is, but CJ has had one hell of an NBA career. If you score 20 points in the league for like a decade, you're pretty good. Um, so like, it wasn't a surprise that Ant didn't get an extension in, in the summertime, but he will be he will be eligible for a new contract or he will enter restricted free agency rather this summer. So there is his future will be decided this summer. And restricted free agency, if you if for those of you who don't know all of the league's rules, is that um, he will the Blazers will extend him a qualifying offer, which is basically a one year formality deal, and that means they will give him the right to match any offer he receives on the open market. They'll have his bird rights, so they can go over the salary cap to sign him. Basically, the Blazers will be allowed to pay him whatever they want, and if another team offers him a contract, they will have the right of first refusal to match that contract. Um, so, if the Blazers want Amphrey Simons in the fold, they have they have all of the tools to decide whether he is. And for me, I don't think his position with the team has necessarily changed. Obviously, he was a Neil Olshay guy. Um, but if you believe that Joe Cronin, the current uh, interim GM of the Blazers, was you know a player personnel guy, a scout guy, and then an assistant GM, you would assume that to some extent, Amphrey Simons is a Joe Cronin guy. You know, someone he scouted and and thought that could help the team. We don't know what like in the war war room or draft room, like whether Cronin was was pro ant or or anti-ant that sounds so bad but like um you know whether he was for ant or against the the pick or whatever or or, where he stood but like one of the things um that uh from the ben falk actually the uh, who the operator of clean the glass who worked with cronin in um in Portland said that like one of Cronin's big things when he was with with the when falk first started with the blazers was that you you should express your opinion anti for whatever it is um when when you're having the meetings like you should be not be afraid to express a contrary opinion and you should stand firmly in your beliefs but once the team makes a decision you're all in on that decision so you got to assume once they decide on ant cronin's all in on ants but all that is to say like the blazers have it i don't think that ants play the last eight games or not stepping in and being like a 20 point per game scorer on this particular roster with the whatever compliments um i don't think that has a long term has changed the long term outlook. I think they should. I think they will still be very interested in in securing him on the roster long term, and and would be willing to pay him the cost to do so. There's more calculations to it. If they don't trade CJ McCollum at the deadline, then I think that complicates things. I don't think you can have four highly paid six foot three guards. That means that you have to trade someone in the summer. So then you know, around the draft. So before free agency, the Blazers would make, uh, make that decision. I also think that Amphrey Simons has to be considered for a trade potential. Like, um, you know, some other team might want him, and maybe trading him now allows you to sort of better the franchise in the near and long term or sort of near and midterm to maximize Dame's window. That doesn't mean that Simons isn't good. Doesn't mean all those things. It just means like, that's kind of the nature of this is that you might have to maximize your chances to win by trading a good player away. Um, I, I kind of still see Simons as, like I said, as, as like a, as a good basketball player. He certainly hasn't stepped up in this to fill this void. He was also coming off. Uh, he missed three games with an ankle injury and his numbers have been down after an ankle injury, which, you know, can happen in the league. Little bumps and bruises can, can, you know, they pile up and sometimes just shooters don't shoot as well when they've got little, um, you know, nicks and bumps. So a bruise, bumps and bruises along the way. It's, the NBA season is long and challenging. I don't think eight games will define the season, but I think family twine, it's right of you to recognize that Ant hasn't been, he hasn't stepped up and been like a, been the star that maybe some think he can be in this eight game stretch. He's been a little bit worse. Some of it is the roster stuff. I think if Anthony Simons didn't play alongside Norm and didn't play alongside Dame, one, there'd just be more ball for him to have. And two, his defensive deficiencies and maybe his um, his passing deficiencies, because I don't think he passes off the dribble very well. He's got he's gotten better at just basic reads, but his like 
high level passing off the dribble, which is the mark of like a really good NBA point guard and doesn't have that quite yet. Um, and I don't, I don't regard that as a big deal. I just regard that as neither does Norm, neither does CJ really. And now you add another guy who's not a great passer and blah, blah, blah into the mix. Like the fit is a little bit clunky. So I don't think this, I don't think the long-term outlook has changed, but um, I think without a doubt, the short-term um, in the near term, Ant struggles have been highlighted uh, in this stretch without CJ McCollum. So thanks family twine for the thoughtful question, considering both the present and the future of the trailblazers. I, I appreciate a thoughtful question. That's why you ask a good mailbag question. You might get it uh, expanded upon uh, locked on blazers pod at gmail.com and at Mike G rich. If you want to ask questions for the show in the third segment, I want to close out the show talking about previous tailspins for the blazers. Um, this was brought to my mind by another question asker from the mailbag. And then I kind of looked at sort of what it has taken in the past for the Blazers to pull out of bad starts to begin the year. So that's what we'll do in the third segment is talk about how the Blazers have recovered from bad starts amidst another bad start for the Trailblazers. But before we do that, I want to tell y'all about Bet Online. It's just the fastest and easiest way to bet on all your sports action, whatever that sports action might be. NFL is entering the final weeks of its regular season and then the playoffs. College football playoffs are here, and then we'll have the national championship game as well as the very end of bowl season. Uh, there's also soccer games going on all over Europe and, and abroad elsewhere. Uh, there's NHL hockey that should resume here in the near future. There's uh, combat sports like boxing and MMA. You can even play your favorite Vegas casino games at betonline.ag. So take advantage of this offer right now. Do not wait. Go to betonline.ag on your mobile device, your desktop, and when you're making your first deposit, use the promo code LOCKEDON, and you will get a 50% welcome bonus. That's promo code locked on for a 50% welcome bonus at betonline.ag bet online where the game starts still a pass first point guard still mike richmond still listening to locked on blazers we talked about the blazers loss to the jazz we talked about Anthony simon's last eight games where he's been just a little bit worse and it makes it it makes you kind of wonder about what uh, his his future might be with be like with the team. I think it has very little impacts, but I I agree with with the question asker that certainly Anthony Simons has been notably hasn't stepped into the void created by CJ McCollum's absence. But uh, what I want to talk about in the third segment to close the show is bad starts for the Blazers. They're in the midst of another bad start. They just haven't been good. <laughs> you you've seen it. You know it. Um, you know they're thirteen and twenty one. But this isn't the first time that they've started poorly. And, and, and I want to look back at some other bad starts and kind of how they've pulled out of those tailspins and apply that to this lens. So let's let's jump in the not way back machine, but a little bit back machine. And then we'll kind of jump to, to the present and look forward for this team. In 2015-16, that was the first year post Lamarcus. The Blazers started 14 and 20 and were 15 and 24 on January 8th. They're bad. Then they ripped off an 18 and 4 stretch from January 10th to March 1st. And they finished the year at 29 and 14 to finish with 44 wins and make the playoffs as the fifth best team in the West. No trades, nothing special. This was just a team that kind of found itself in the middle of January and was really good to close the year, just finished red hot. Um, th th that team was trying to tank and they didn't do anything special. They just, it kind of gelled at some point in the, in, in the middle of early January, second week of January, and they took off an 18 and four stretch. The trick to that season, get hot and stay hot. Not that simple, I would say, but that was the trick. The following year, though, the Blazers started right back there again. They were 14 and 20 to begin the 2016-17 season and 23 and 32 on February 13th. Excuse me, 23 and 33 on February 15th. Um, they traded for Yusuf Nurkic. They lost that game. They were 23 and 33, but they traded for Nurk on um, February 15th and they closed the season 18 and 8. What they did to pull out of this tailspin, they traded a starter. And quite frankly, they traded a starter knowing that this, that not that they were trying to make a playoff push. They were kind of, kind of saying this season stinks. We're, you know, not eight, we're nine, 10 games under 500 when we're uh, making this deal. They traded starting center Mason Plumley. They, they took a flyer on a former lottery pick who was out of the rotation in Denver and kind of um, unhappy with the situation in Denver. They got a, you know, Plumley was considered a, the better player in that deal, right? So they got a first round pick for their troubles. And it was one of the great trades in, that the franchise has made over the last decade. Nurk obviously re-energized the franchise, and they were really good for the following two seasons. And the, um, you know, and they, they they get a first round pick for their for their struggles. Anyways, um, they ended up packaging that pick. Blah 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 blah. But so what did they do in 2016-17? They traded one of their core parts, Plumley, who had been a big part of their resurgence, the 44 win season a year ago, just wasn't 
up to it. He was their most tradable part at the time. They made a trade that was risky. Let's, let's, let's be clear, risky. This was not a trade that was seen as the Blazers improving. It was a trade that was seen as the Blazers admitting they weren't good and just leaning into that. And Nurk saved their season, 18-8, and eight, and they finished 41-41 and 41 and were um, summarily swept out of the playoffs by, finished eighth in the West and were swept out of the playoffs. Like, it didn't end rosy, but it was a trade that got them from out of the playoffs to into the playoffs and kind of changed their projection over the next two years. In 2019-20, the Blazers started 40-20 and 20 again through 34 games. Uh, they're through 35 games now, basically the same, same record. Um, the Blazers were 29 and 37 on March 10th when the season was uh, halted due to the coronavirus outbreak. Um, so they weren't, they, it didn't exactly work for them. In fact, in January, again, they made a trade. What do you do when the season isn't going um, well? They made a trade. It was a, a theme of the Neil Olshay era. They made in season trades, usually minor trades, um, always minor trades. Let's be real. Um, and they traded for Trevor Reza and Caleb Swanigan. They sent out uh, Kent Bazemore and, uh, and, uh, Another big, I'm forgetting now, Anthony Tolliver. Um, should have had Tolliver down in my notes. Forgot about, forgot about AT. Um, and they, they traded for Ariza and Swanigan. Swanigan immediately played. Ariza immediately started. And they, they finished that run uh, till March 10th, 10 and 11. They got to the bubble. They won games in the bubble. The Memphis Grizzlies didn't win games in the bubble. Grizzlies went two and six in the bubble. I totally forgot about that. Uh, then they played a head-to-head game play-in and the Blazers won a one game play-in and, and made the playoffs. Like they absolutely scrambled for their lives. And so I think that year, that 2019, 20 year seems like a reasonable look. I mean, it's, it's like a, it's a bizarre year, like the bubble and the pause and all those things, but like they weren't good. They made a trade. They were marginally better. And then they absolutely scrambled to make the playoffs and finish eighth and got lost in five games to the Lakers. Like, um, the, like this was, this is sometimes how it works. It's like you make that scramble and, and, and you end up, you know, you get there, but the trade you make only marginally improves you. And so I kind of think where the Blazers are is somewhere between that, like 2016, 17 and 2019, 20 starts where they're not, they're clearly not good. It's not working out. You have to do something. You know you have to do something. But do you do the thing that they did in 2016-17 where you trade a starter and you admit that maybe this isn't going to work out and you take a risk knowing knowing full well that it could be the end of your season? Or do you do something like 2019-20 and trade kind of like marginal guys? This I guess it would be Robert Covington in this sense, like your most tradable expiring contract for another guy that's kind of on the same level and hope that like the fit change takes you from a eight games under 500 team to a one game under 500 team, right? Like, do you think that is, is that, can you make that, um, that level of trade or do you go a little bit bigger for me? I would really prefer the Blazers go bigger. I prefer they, you know, if it comes to it, trade Nurk because maybe that's the way you get the most return. I'm not sure that's the case now. Maybe you trade Rocco because that's the most return. I would like to see them trade CJ McCollum because I think that's, it's just, it's time. We've, we've gotten sort of, you know, six years into this experiment and they owe it to Dame to try something else at that um, next to him as a, you know, obviously there's going to be challenges because how much value you can get back for Covington, how much value you can get, get back for um, CJ McCollum, how much value you can get back for Nurk. And if you need to add more value, how much sweet, how sweet does a Anthony Simons or an Azir Little make the trade? And if you do that, is it worth the trade off? Like obviously challenges, but I think why I wanted to go in sort of the, the not so far back machine is to say like in the past, the Blazers address these by either making a, 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 trading a starting level player for a risk or trading sort of their mid-range uh, contributors, you know, like the, a role player for a role player and hoping that a change in role players would, would do it. A change is, I, I think a trade is inevitably coming for sure. Um, I don't know when, you know, the trade deadline is February 10th and I would say deadline spur action. So closer to February 10th makes sense to me uh, like it would happen closer to them than more, more recently. But like, you know, the guys are on the phone. I think the COVID stuff really makes trading trades difficult because every NBA team is trying to kind of figure out what they are and then just feel the team. And so you're not thinking about big, big structural changes, big, big changes. Well, um, you know, a lot of the league is dealing with COVID outbreaks and replacement players and guys on 10 days, et cetera, et cetera. So I think if you look at the Blazers past track record and you look at where they are now, a trade is coming and a trade is the one that salvages the season because that 2015-16 year was an entirely new team and they just kind of found themselves and took off. 
I don't think they're going to, I don't think this group you can watch and say, yeah, they're going to be 29 and 14, you know, 15 games over to close the year. Like they're going to just take off the last 33 games and like, look like a legitimately good team. I don't think it's going to click for them. It might, they probably have enough talent to get somewhere close, but I think their defense defensive deficiencies um, and just their size, like they don't, have, that team was bigger on the wings, Gerald Henderson and Mo Harkless and Alfred Camino better complement to what they have now on the wings um, with Damon CJ. Like it just, it is what it is. Uh, roster construction really matters. So I think a trade is coming. I think it looks like those, um, um, those other years. And for me, I hope it's a trade of a, I hope it's the big trade. I hope they take the big swing. I don't have any inside information, nor would I like, um, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I'm not going to fake the funk. Like I'll tell you when I know stuff here. Um, so I can't tell you when it's going to happen or what it might look like, but I know that the Blazers have pledged to be aggressive. Um, and part of that, the subtext of pledging to be aggressive is trading CJ McCollum if they can. That's just an, an inevitable part of where they are. It might also mean trading Ant. It could mean trading Nas. It could mean trading Nurk and Rocco. I think it could mean trading literally everyone on the roster, not named Damian Lamont, Ollie Lillard, and where they are now versus where they want to be. Like they, they still want to be a competitive team. Um, they just have to make a decision. Do they take a risk that might make them not competitive this year? They enter the lot, they, you know, get a lottery pick and try to figure it out? Or do they try to kind of salvage this season and get back to playoff level? For me, I don't think a low level playoff seed matters, but I don't talk to Damian Lord every day and know what his choices, like his preferences are. I don't talk to the Vulcan. I don't talk to Burt Cold and the folks at Vulcan and Jody Allen and know what they want. If, if other people want, like some of the preferences of the other actors and, and Dame and Jody, for sure, the biggest ones will kind of dictate what they do. But for me, I would say take a risk, be okay with being bad this year because you're already bad as is. Go get a lottery pick and try to make sure that whatever moves you make, make you better for next season, like right away better. You can't, three years down the line doesn't matter as much as like ne next fall. You need to be, try to be a competitive team again because Damon Lord is one of the best players quite frankly to ever play in the NBA and you got to if he wants to be part of the team you you got to maximize your chances with him um if it comes to a point where that's not going to work then we'll talk about moving on from Dame and those trades but i think for the for the near term for this trade deadline um you owe it to Dame and whatever to try to be as good as possible for next season and i to me i'm at the point where this season you might just say it's a wash we're not going to do it let's take a real risk let's go find a Yusuf Nurkic out there that could really change the trajectory of the franchise that's how they've pulled out of tailspins in the past for me that's the direction that they need to be in this season as well all right, that's going to do it for today's show. And tomorrow's show, Jason Quick of The Athletic joins us. Uh, we're going to talk about, um, you know, quite frankly, his beef with Dame, um, or Dame's beef with him, I think is actually the much more accurate state. <laughs> Jason doesn't have any beef. Jason is as um, has caught the ire of the Blazers point guard. We're going to, I'm going to just straight up ask him what the deal is with that. So you will not want to miss that show. Make sure you are listening to that one. Jason also just provides great insights on the team. So make sure you're listening and tell your friends to do the same. It's available on YouTube. Go subscribe to the YouTube channel and wherever you get podcasts, just search Locked on Blazers. We'll be right there waiting for you. Appreciate you listening. Talk to you soon.